we had a thing about when you cross the line, you're in, you know, and we'd have scraps at training and things like that. But as soon as you're off the pitch, you're all best buddies again. Cause it was, it was nothing was ever personal. You know, I, I had to go make it myself. And I think that was a good um, lesson for me to, to really buy into. We, we always said pressure is a privilege. You got to take ownership of it. And the only way to combat pressure is, is preparation. Before this episode starts, I have a small favor I need to ask you. Since the channel started, over 90% of those that have watched have not subscribed. So if you liked any of my podcast episodes or any of the content on this channel, please hit the subscribe button down below. It helps the channel grow. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Phil Greening, welcome to the podcast. Oh, welcome. Thanks for having me. My first question is, how did your rugby career start? How did it become part of your life? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't start rugby till pretty late. I was a, I was a footballer. I, I, I played football, um, till about 13, I think. And then started to, my, my mates were all going to play for a local rugby club. So sort of joined in that, but I, I was a footballer. I was, you know, I was on a school books for a swindled town and things like that. So I, I, I was football through and through, but, um, my mates played at, played at a local rugby club dragged me down a couple of times and, uh, you know, I was at that age as well where, um, you know, football was quite, didn't have a clubhouse. I was just playing. My dad would take me straight home. You know, that was it. And my mates were still at the rugby club. Uh, so like, for instance, I played on a Saturday. On a Sunday, I'd do the rugby with my mates. I'd have to then run off to football, play in the afternoon. And then, you know, the, the girls from school were coming down at lunchtime and there's a few, the boys are playing pool and stuff like that. So like, dad, take me back to the rugby club. Um, and he was happy so he could have a beer on a Sunday afternoon as well. So, you know, sort of rugby took over because of the women and uh, the social aspect more than anything. But I sort of stumbled on it um, around 13, 14, and then made my debut for Gloucester at 18, and that was it, really. Just fell in love with it, and it was all sort of happened um, off chance because, you know, really I was, a, I was trying to be a footballer, if anything, but I think I got a bit a bit big and I was, I was growing up pretty fast. I was a bit like a young Moby sat in the middle of the midfield, just banging balls about a big chunky kid. <laughs> but uh, so I don't know if I'd have made it, um, but thankfully, yeah, it sort of it gave me the skills and it led me down the path of rugby. Did you find that you had uh, transferable skills from football going into rugby? I know um, a lot of yeah, academics very... mention that, don't they, in terms of elite development? I'm, I'm intrigued yeah, if that was a thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I was into everything from, you know, um, tennis, you know, football, all that football was, was massive. That's all I ever played, really. And, uh, you know, tr transferring the skills into rugby was was easy and it definitely went across. And, um, you know, some of the ball skills and, you know, kicking and striking the ball and all that I, I could do. And that was quite a um, quite a different skill for, for a front rower uh, as me you know I could rock up and kick goals and things like that because I could strike a ball because of my football background. So you mentioned Gloucester talk to me about that experience in terms of maybe playing at that professional level very different to maybe experiences within grassroots football and uh, obviously now you've got to try and well you're trying to make it a career and it becomes a little bit more of a, an elite mindset an elite environment talk to me about that and how yeah, that for you. I mean I when I was when I was sort of 17 18 it was uh, it was just going into the professional era then so you know no one really knew what that meant um but you know so we still trained on a Tuesday Thursday night like a amateur club and you know the boys who, who were on sort of semi contracts um you know we, we did weights in the day and we, we it was trying to turn professional um and you know back then you still had a crossover from the amateur days and people and the new guys coming in trying to be professional and then leading that elite environment to you know, so that there was a mixed bag of, of mindsets as well which was was difficult at times and and then suddenly when the strength and conditioning come into it the mindset shifted you know dramatically because of the conditioning and, and the way we we went about ourselves it, it totally changed the Gloucester and it went from a you know, a, a, a hard-nosed, social, amateur sort of team to to a professional team very quickly. And, you know, people fell off and, and fell away because of that. But it was an interesting time to be around simply because no one in rugby knew what being a professional meant. Um, but it soon caught up and, and, and been leaps and bounds, I think. You mentioned that that mindset. Persistence, I can imagine, is, is a big big characteristic there because obviously you mentioned that amateur perspective and kind of not knowing what if 
I, I presume. How did you kind of keep persistence and kind of focus during that period for you? Uh, I, I think I, I was lucky to have some good mentors, um, you know, the guys who who had been there and played for England and the British Lions, and they obviously saw a talent in me, um, and they helped get me into some habits, really, and, and some good traits. And, and I suppose back then it was being professional, you know, doing the stuff that, you need to do when no one's watching. Um, and I, I think, you know, they taught me to go off and do my own stuff. I think that was a big thing as well. You know, not, not relying on what the coaches, you know, I, I had to go and make it myself. And I think that was a good um, lesson for me to, to really buy into. And, um, you know, it's always kept me in, in good stead. I think when, especially when sometimes in my career, I did fall off the path, and, you know, getting myself back on it was, was quite easy. Cause I went back to those habits that, that created the, the, the player I, I sort of become. Mm. Did did you have any good mentors or any good coaches that stand out during that during that period? Even if, it doesn't necessarily have to be that period. It could be kind of on a reflection of your, your career. Is there anyone that yeah, kind of helped I, you in that? Yeah, I think that first one was a guy called Mike Teague, who's a, who played for England, British Lions. He was my Gloucester captain, and so he sort of took me under his wing and, and gave me. You know, he he he'd already you know, played for England, played in the World Cup, you know, so he he gave me some advice there. But the big changing point for me, not just in my playing career, but my coaching career now as well, is my, my, my coach at, at Wasps was Warren Gatland, um, who's in, now back second term for the Welsh uh, coaching job, and uh, he's British Lion coach. So he was a big, big influence on me. And uh, the other guy, which, which actually transformed a lot of um, the way I played and me as a professional, but also my career and education post-career is Craig White, who's a renowned strength and conditioning coach uh, in rugby. Uh, and actually, them two actually transformed the way we played at Was that gave us the success we had over the years with the four premierships back-to-back and the two European Cups. And that sort of golden era was all built around the SNC and our mindset. So those two have, have had a massive impact on, on my life and still do. You know, I still... I'm still mentored by both of them with, with the roles I do at the moment. You mentioned uh, strengthening and conditioning and even, you know, other disciplines that have advanced um, in terms of change or, or someone trying to introduce new methods. Was there any, did that ever cause conflict in terms of players? I know even from, for example, other sports, which is football, that there's a lot of analysis and there's other factors <laughs> that kind of have become apparent more recently in the modern game. With rugby, did anything along those lines come um, into your career and you had to maybe adapt and maybe think about things differently? Is there anything that stands out? No, I understand, you know, the, the sudden uh, mo- the monitoring of everything from, from your well-being to your sleep to your heart rate to all the data, the GPS, you know, you name it, you know, what you, the, the volume of what you're lifting in the gym, like everything changed overnight, you know, and that was pioneered by Craig, really. And, and um, the, the one thing I will say about a rugby mentality, um, players' mentality, is that if you say he's going to make him good, he'll do it, you know, no matter what. So I don't think that everyone, there's no conflicts. Everyone just mm. got on with it because they knew, they trusted in what they're being given. I think, you know, from my experience with other sports, sometimes people don't want that change or, or question it. Why am I doing it? But actually, I think a lot of the rugby mindset, well, if it, if it gives me another 1%, mate, I'm in. And I think that's... Um, so So when that all came into rugby, I don't think there was any conflict. We just got on with it. And suddenly you see the benefits of, of the how the methodology in, in the training we had and um you know and then you start winning trophies so you're like well that must work and then everyone started following the way we trained at wasps and uh, the culture and um you know that the rest is now you know sort of folklore and what we've done really you said wasps a lot of success especially in the early 2000s yeah what, what do you think that uh, you kind of alluded to it w- within your answer just then but what do you think that was in terms of developing a good culture developing a good winning mentality, uh, as well as, you know, having good technical and, and tactical players, a co- combination of all those things. Is there anything that stands out in terms of that success and the justification and why that happened? Yeah, no, you, you're right. It is a combination of all those things. But I think the big thing was, um, you know, there's a lot of player ownership. I think the man management by Warren was 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 fantastic. You know, he's he knows how to get the best out of players and so does Craig. And I think he's, um, they're, fitness team at the time you know they've all gone on to bigger and better jobs they've all breeded in, in there so you know Mark Bitcom for instance went to Wigan head, head of performance Man City he's at you know, head of performance he's back at England rugby now and Craig's gone on to a thing you know Paul Stridgeham's gone on to Wales and British Lions you know there's all these guys have gone off into 
um, into, it, it was all developed from that culture and that competitiveness um, and, and man management of Warren Gatlin that let people be open and, and try things. And, you know, he, his, man, his management of Craig especially was, you know, Craig was gone. You know, if Craig said we're not training or we're only training for 30 minutes, that's what we were doing. And he trusted that in Craig. So if he said, well, you know, um, you know, for instance, for me, like, well, Phil's pretty tired today. He had a tough session yesterday. We're not going to get the best. There's no point in doing it. Gats would not say, no, I want Phil. I want all my players training. He'd go, well, great. What's crack it? Right, Phil, you're out. And you're like, what? You know, but he managed you and he's, he accepted that the SNC had the lead and, and that changed, I think, the whole environment and then, you know, the competition between players. Um, I think the, the, the also thing, you know, Gats had a great thing about if you're a man at night, you're a man in the morning. So if anyone went on the, you know, had a couple of cheeky beers or, or anything in the week or anything like that, if you didn't turn up for, you had to turn up for work, you know, and if you didn't, then he'd come on to you. And it, it sort of actually gave you an ownership of, I, I can go out without being sneaky, you know, because once you turned up and did a job, it was okay. But actually that, that sort of went against what we needed to do because, you know, if you went out that, in the night on a Tuesday night, say, you knew you were going to get pushed by Craig and Warren on the Wednesday. So you're like, I can't go out. So that actually stopped the culture of drinking. Yeah. In, in a reverse psychology because Gap's like, yeah, go on. You're like, oh, really? But then you knew and you, you, you couldn't do it. So the culture changed massively in that side. But, you know, the, the fitness levels and how we pushed each other in training and, the, and then that, that bred a, a camaraderie that we've been through dark places together and that was untouchable. You know, we had a thing about when you cross the line, you're in. Yeah, you know, and we'd have scraps of training and things like that. But as soon as you're off the pitch, you're all best buddies again. Because it was, it was nothing was ever personal. It was just challenging each other to be the best you could be for our team. And um, that really got us together. And I think that was the key to the success was a lot of it was, was Craig and, and Warren's man management. It's interesting how giving that autonomy and trust enables you to yeah. kind of create that culture. You know, I, again, just, just on reflection of coaching as a discipline, a lot of coaches feel like they have to coach but in that sense is a little bit more like well we trust you and we give you a bit of ownership and yeah, you know, pay us that way yeah yeah and i think the ownership goes a long way be it from you know the guys used to do little things and i do it now with, with the teams i work with you, you, you let the players pick the kit training kit it has no impact on anything but they feel they've got ownership and they feel they've got something and you know that that gives them a deeper connection to the team you know he he also created leaders you know he he wouldn't you know, create a um, a dictatorship or something. That he'd lead the line outs or scrums. He'd go, well, you're my scrum captain. What do you want to do? You're my line out captain. What, well, your defence, your attack. You guys, you know, because you're on the pitch delivering it. I'm just trying to help you and guide you. And uh, that that really did shape the ownership of the team. And um, you know, I think when you look at it now, that people in that team who's gone on to be really good coaches. You know, myself has gone into international coaching. Alex King's now is at Wales. He worked in front of Sean Edwards in, with France now. Uh, George Scrimton is head coach of Gloucester. Trevor Woman's the scrum coach there. You know, there's probably like 10 different players from that era who's gone on to, to coaching and, and being quite successful. And I think a lot of it's all built around what, what we started with Wasp, really. Mm. Have you ever come across uh, Carlo Ancelotti quite leading? Have you ever come yeah. across that book? Yeah. That kind yeah. of reflects some of the artifacts within that. I, th I think there's yeah. a... There's a classic artifact around giving the players the opportunity to give the team talk at a cup final, and it kind yeah, of relates yeah. to what you said. Then it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting methodology. Yeah, no, um, it is. You know, it, you know, there's a lot of coaches, you know, especially in rugby, you know, you, before games, you know, they they'll, they'll ask you, know, what 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 are you going to bring to the team? You know, what what are you expecting off your teammates today? And the players will you know voice that, and it's almost like a, a, a an unwritten contract that now you've said it, you got to deliver. <laughs> And that, that's quite powerful as well, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of expectations, then, Phil, how how did you cope with that? If you were in an environment where there was a lot of trust and a lot of autonomy given to you, and obviously big pressured environments to to want to succeed and continue success, how did you deal with that? Is there any mechanisms that you you can share with our listeners that uh, stand out? Yeah, I, I think it was a mindset change of like you know we we always said pressure is a privilege. You know, and you got to take ownership of it. And the only way to to um, combat pressure is, is preparation. And so we we the de we always went back to the detail and like you know like each each play at a time sort of thing. And we dealt with it that way. And we sort of took the old you know Bill Walsh um, 
you know, the, you look after your performance and the scoreboard looks after itself sort of mentality. And I think yeah. that's what we, and I still adopt that now because I still believe that's the best way to deal with all that and um, just focus on yourself and, and delivering what you need to deliver and the pressure and everything else will fall away and the scoreboard takes care of itself. But mm. definitely saw it as a mindset of, you know, this is a privilege to be here and have this pressure. You know, not, not many rugby teams or players have that. So embrace it, you know, embrace the grind because that's mm. what produces gold. Did that ever change going into like the international stages around maybe the British and Irish Lions? Did obviously Six well, Nations and bigger <laughs> events and the, the, the public yeah. scrutiny that you might face? Obviously, it might be different from club level. I'm, I'm just intrigued on, on whether that, that was a different uh, approach or similar approach. Yeah, obviously. I mean, you know, when I when I play when I was with England, you know, we had some great players around me. You know, Martin Johnson and Delalio and Johnny Wilkinson, Will Greenwood, Tinder. All the, all these guys were. You know, Neil Back, Richard Hill, you know, they all come from pretty successful clubs themselves. You know, at the time, you know, Walsh and Leicester were the biggest two clubs in the country. So it was the same mentality when we went there. And, um, you know, and then you had Clive Woodward who who looked at every bit of detail he could, you know, and, and any sort of edge that we could get. And, um, you know, that that's where the, the mindset changed was the details, you know, and everything we did. You know, Clive was massive planner on literally everything and, and wouldn't wouldn't drop the standards uh for the team for, for anyone or anything you know and you know when when he took over he wanted us to have the best of everything and and focus on rugby and never have to worry about or, or question that we haven't got everything we needed to, to perform and when things didn't work out like that he he would change i mean one time we, we toured south africa and um get a note through the door the first night in our hotel you know pack your bags in the morning we're like you know, we got sorry, got a emergency meeting. So we had a meeting. We're all thinking Clive's leaving. He's gone. He's getting sacked. <laughs> and um, and he, uh, he he got us in this meeting. Started talking, and uh, he he explained that you know when he first got involved, he wanted the best for us, and this hotel's not good enough. So he's moved us out of his own card. You know, moved us to another the best hotel in Cape Town, and. And that was that, you know, because he didn't want us having any excuses of not to wow. perform. So, um, you know, him, you know, all, you know, bringing in, you know, uh, eyesight trainers and all these little things that, that could could make a difference, he, he did bring in. And so that was a big jump of mentality. But I think the pressure in it just come with it. I think we were all used to it. And, and to be fair, things like the press and Clive was very good and the media people around England to keep that all away from you anyway. So we never really felt it, if I'm honest. Do you, do you feel like he was very ahead of his time? You mentioned technology. Oh, and oh very, very much so. I mean, mm. honestly, he was constantly looking at um, different angles. and people. I mean, if you, if you could sell him summer, he'd buy it just as... If you told him you know, to drink Domestos, that would make you a better player. He, he'd buy it for you. you know, he, he was looking at anything. And some of it, yeah, a thousand ideas, some are great. You know, about you know, nine nine hundred and ninety eight of them were, were, were dreadful, but but that's what he was searching for, you know. And he, he made the environment um, no excuses, you know. That's he always said that you've got no excuse but to perform because we're doing everything for you. And um, you know, he was ahead of his time by a long way, by a long way. You mentioned um, earlier around Leicester, and obviously you as wasps were going yeah. for for major honours in. Um, did, did, did that cause a little bit of tension between players internationally? And, and again, reflect uh, reflect upon football as a, as a very good example. The English national team, especially in the early two thousands, is that there's a big emphasis on club um, orientated players and wanting to to win at club level, and that impacts obviously uh, the golden generation. Did that? Did you ever have any issues along that? Uh, uh, along that? Uh, no, along no that I mean there, there obviously was. You know, the, the, you had the Leicester click because Leicester had you know five or six players in the squad we had five or six players in the squad you know and you turn up to lunch and they'd all be <laughs> on their table and we it was a bit of that but you know once we crossed the line in training we you know we all mucked in and you know we're, we all become one for the for the goal really but yeah there's always a little bit of that a little bit of niggle about you know the club stuff and especially because you know we we played before you joined you might have played Leicester on a Saturday and join up with England on Sunday so there might have been a bit of an altercation that carried on into training <laughs> at England on Monday, but there was never, no, not not really. No, I think, I think that that mentality, and you know, the, the British Lions, you know, int intensifies all that really because 
you know, we do, you know, batter each other in the Six Nations and then join up with the British Lions and we're, you have to be the best of mates. And I think, again, everyone realises they what a privilege and a, and, a, and a team to be involved in it is. So, you know, you, you're in it and you're all in it together and you become something special that can't be taken away from you. You know, you, you make you make history, I suppose, by becoming a British Lion and, you know, that's a special place to be. So, yeah, all that gets left at the door, which is, that, that's that's really special and, and, and interesting to see because you do see, you know, a Welsh and Irish man or an Englishman, Scott, find it out, but they will be best roommates you know, the, the next day because you're now a British Lion and you're different. Is, is that kind of within the leaders and the managers in terms of bringing that unity and cohesion? A sense of respect, I get, I get the feeling that's kind of a, an emphasis within what you're saying, but th- does that come from above or is there a little bit of, okay, I need to drop my guard here if we want, if we want to do well. I'm intrigued on that process. Yeah, no, I, I think as a player, it's expected of you. It, it really is to leave leave everything at the door. Um, but I think the key to a good British Lions team is is that togetherness, which is driven by the management. You know, I okay. think the successful ones. You look at the the '97 tour. You know, the the the, the to get the parties and the drinking, the nights. You know, everything they did to to make it as one was uh, was key to that success. And when Warren Gatland done the Lions the last three tours, you know, having events that the guys can let the hair down I suppose and be open and, and be humble it is um it is really important for team camaraderie and you know those guys you 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 go on those tours with they're, they're mates for life you know I still you know Martin Williams and uh, Scott Murray who my two roommates you're one Welsh one Scott and that's who I'm still best mates now and you know when we see each other it's like we've, we've never left and you know that's the beauty of it but he's driven by I think it has to be driven or, or brought into by the management because it needs to filter down um, so it, it's important that coaches understand that understand the heritage of the Lions what it means to of, f- to be involved in that team and I think you know I think as soon as you get picked for that I think that's just poured all over you as a as a player anyway so you know every, everything else from from a, any grievances you have in another country or a player just gets left behind because this is somewhat bigger than you or your country. Hmm. How, do you, how do you kind of develop that emotional and intelligence? Because obviously you're playing against the opposition a few times and you you try not to kind of get carried away with everything that kind of comes with the competition. And there might be a little bit of bickering or personal uh, factors that go on on the pitch and whether that maybe continues off the pitch I'm not sure you might be able to yeah, yeah. tell me about that but I'm, I'm intrigued around like your emotional state and, and kind of keeping focused and how, how does that work going into those games because uh, it's oh. a long process uh, I presume in terms of preparation and mentality yeah it's a, it's a long weeks you know it's, it's it's a good six to eight weeks together trying to mm. prep for these tours you know and um, it's uh it's an interesting question, actually, because the, the the emotional side of it is like a roller coaster, you know. Because it's you you the enormity of of you know touring with your with your, your England or all British clients is huge, especially when you go to rugby countries like New Zealand or South Africa and Australia. You know, it's um and everyone and and with the Lions, it's quite special because you know the Aussies have waited four years, or well, no more than that, was it like twelve years? Sorry for you to come back on their soil so with the Lions because they tour these countries every four years yeah. you know you, it's a long time for those fans and players to to actually have a Lions test and for them it's another massive notch on, on their playing career to actually play against the Lions and, and win a series so for them it's it, there's a massive amount of pressure so the emotions on both sides are huge much more than a you know, an England versus New Zealand tour, you know, it's um, it's everything for these players because you might not never get a Lions tour again. You know, the players who go on these tours and get three, three tours, say, they're, they're special players, you know. So it's a likewise for the Aussies, South Africa. So that emotion is massive. So you have to control that, you know, as a player, uh, as a squad and management. And you have to keep focus on that on that next job and, and not let any of the distractions or, or the tactics, especially from the media. I mean, the Aussies are brilliant at that, um, of getting the distractions, you know, and, and feeding it in that way. It's, it's hard. And I think those trips, especially you've got to create an, your own bubble. And that probably helps with the team camaraderie as well, because you're all in it together and one player gets attacked. You're all sort of uh, getting attacked. And, uh, 
it's it's difficult to control it, but I think like any game, you know, you, you've got to take what one rep at a time, one cycle at a time, one phase at a time, and and just do your job to the best of ability that fits you into the team, and, and not get distracted by that because it's it's easily done, and an emotional, you know, player is 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 not a very good player for for most teams, mm-hmm. I think. I think you see all these documentaries now at the moment around the insight of sport. And uh, yeah. I think the relationship that you see a lot with with coaches and players is it's like a transaction. So the, the coach wants something out of the player. But you'll notice that, and again, these documentaries emphasise the relationships players have with um, you know, the chefs, the, the people working yeah. in the canteen, where it's a little bit more relaxed. There's a little bit more of an environment where potentially they could open up and talk about maybe their feelings, etc., to, yeah. to those kind yeah. of people. It's, it's and, I, and my point is, is around environment. I think that's kind of the key, key factor there in terms of where these maybe conversations around psychology do take place and how they happen. Yeah, and I think it's you know having an open door as a, a coach and and having that connection with the player. You know, I, I mean, I, I I got a massive uh, like um, an example really is Andy Robinson was the England forwards coach and um, me and he was a school teacher and so he, me and him really didn't have great relationship but you know for instance you know, I'd be at breakfast and he'd come down I'd be the only person in the room he'd get his breakfast and go sit in the corner and wouldn't say anything to me I and mean, then I'd go well I ain't gonna run through walls to you mate you can't even say good morning to me like you know what yeah great you are you know so then we had a conference and then Warren Gunn on the other side would get his breakfast sit right next to you how are you how's the message what's up and, you're blue. and he's interested in you he's invested in you so mm. like I'd run through walls for, for Warren, you know, and, and and do it over and over again. If you walked in now, I, I'd do it now. Because it's that connection. I think coaches miss that, you know, sometimes. And I see in America, because it's very, very much football-led, you know, American football-led, where they're the boss and it's, rah, 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 and it's like, you'll do as I say. And it doesn't work, you know. We're, we're human beings. We need connections. And to get the best of players, you've got to connect. Um, so having that open-door policy, understanding their... Um, there are different bits of the other part of the life which has a massive effect on their performance. You know, if if, if their missus is giving them ag and they're not sleeping at home or the kids are playing up, all that will will filter into their training, their ultimately their performance. So if you can help with their off pitch stuff as much as you can, it will help with their on pitch stuff. And I think that's the biggest learning I've 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 learned from that. And then, like you say, you got people within your staff or people within the environment or the, or the centre that players will just chat to because they feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, it might be the kit man. He's, a, he's, a, he's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a massive connection to the players. You know, the physio is always a great comforter. You know, they'll sit mm-hmm. there and, and tell them out all about their worries, you know, and their gripes in life or, or gripes of the team. You know, it might be, like, hey, we're training, hey, the coaches uh, delivering stuff to players. You know, they might have all these little bits that the physio can feed in. And if you've got a, if you've got a good physio you trust you, and, and the players trust, then, you know, you can get those little insights. So actually, okay, I, I need to have a word with him today. So you go and put your arm around someone, and you are man. And then, you know, that's 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 what creates a good performance and a good environment, I think. What, what do you think maybe that's missed? You mentioned the experiences of maybe the coaches that you've had previously. Is it is that, is that personality? Is that ego? Or is it maybe pressures from above where they have to demand stuff out of players and building relationships might be limited. I'm, I'm intrigued on why, why does that happen? Do you know, if, if, we, yeah. Yeah. if, we, if mean, we know it's a, a fi- an important ingredient, do you know? Yeah, there's a fine line, you know, like, because you don't want to be there, mate, because you need to get deliver bad news now and again, but yeah. you need to have the trust enough for them to trust you. And and I think if you show that you're open and honest and, and you deliver bad news early or you're not scared to have those conversations and, you, and you're open and you're very honest with players, They'll respect you for that. I think my, like managers, coaches who who are open and honest and sort of play mind games or aren't direct with their responses and um, or you know feel that there there's a hierarchy. You know, it, it's, 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 it, I, I think it's an art that you've got to like create a, a, a horizontal sort of management system, but understand that it's very open and honest that you can you can go at you can tell them the what you need to tell them also they can come at you with no no problems you know we can have that we can have be in the office one-on-one we can go at each other but you know what we'll work it out and as long as you agree at the end of the day that mm. the bosses were on my head be it and you're okay with that we've had that conversation that dialogue we can both then go on and, and perform then you know that i think that's a healthy place but i think a lot of coaches still want to be here 
you know, obviously, like I said, in America, it's, it's ridiculous because the football coach is, he's king. He is king. And, you know, no one, no one says a word. And we have that with the players now. It's, you know, maybe, uh, say, say a play's got three options and, you know, the ref, uh, the, the defender will give you this read. If he does that, you do this. If he gives you that read, you do that. If he gives you that, you do that. Okay, well, which one's the best? What, which one do you want me to do? I don't know because I don't know what that defender is going to do. I, you know, but if he does this, 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 this is your answers. But which one do you want me to do, coach? I can't give you that because that's not how I coach, but also that's not our sport. So, you know, you see it in, in players that we get who, from crossover from American football who, who just, the coach is king and they won't say a word, won't say a word to you. Yeah, and it's, it's getting them to open up and trust that actually they can have an opinion and we can have that conversation. But, you know, I think a lot of it is that coaching and how they've opened up to their learning strategies and their, their management tactics that uh, is key to all this, I think. Yeah, it is an interesting process. And I think also, I'll just add to that, um, all coaches don't need to know the answers as well. I think no. having that well, openness to that. Yeah, yeah, I think that openness yeah, displays that, that yeah. point. And, and you know what? I, I've learned so much from players. You know, you give them an idea and they go, well, actually, what if we did that? Or, well, yeah, 100%, let's do it. Great yeah. idea, you know? And they know a lot more than we we give them credit for, I think. You know, we think that if you're a coach, that you've got to give them all the answers. And actually, you got to, it's better to work together because they do know. And also, you're then fueling them and you're educating them to make good decisions on the pitch when you can't do anything. You know, and that's, I think that's in a powerful tool as well. Do you think that shows good leadership and an awareness of leadership? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think some of the best leaders are, are the ones that let people go off and do. I mean, I remember I, it's not sport, but my first job when I had to retire, um, I went and worked for a bank. Uh, and the chairman at the time was a guy called Mervyn Davis. And, and he said, Look, Phil, all you're doing, what you're doing, coaching. He said, My advice would, if what he, what they did with, with, with him in the bank, they said, You know, if you want to be a, um, a, a, a giant company, hire giants. So in other words, don't think that you could go out and do someone else's job. Don't think you're an accountant or don't think you're this. Go get the best people to make you a big, you know, get them, mm. get giant people in those areas to become a giant company. And it's no different in sport, you know. Trust the people that you want in place. Let them have the autonomy to do their job. By all means, have the, you know, oversee and all that, but trust that that person can do their job and let them do it. And, um, you know, and, and, and you know, my thing about Warren Gatland, you know, he let Craig White, when we when we transformed all this fitness and and the, the team we come, he was king. You know, if Craig said that player's not training today or we're only doing 30 minutes or he's not right or he's got to do more or we're doing more, get 100% Craig. And everything was speak to Craig, he's boss. You know, like that that made it a, a totally different environment. And that's the skill I think as a management, uh, a manager that uh, that you need to embrace, I think. Just just to open up that a little bit more, and it kind of relates to the question I've got around lessons learned during your playing career. Is there anything that you've learned in terms of skills and traits? You mentioned leadership then, um, that you, you've taken from your rugby career and kind of applied that into everyday life today. You mentioned your coaching as well. Is there anything that kind of stands out if you were to, to maybe think and reflect on oh, um, what you've um, learned? I, I think, I, think you know, I, I learned a fair bit from Clive from looking at, different aspects and, and, and having a more of an open mind of, of trying things and, and exploring and being creative. I think the man management side of Warren Gatlin was, was massive. And I think still is, you know, he's, um, I think that's why he's so successful and everyone wants to play for him. And I think that's crucial. Um, I think like, personally, I think, you know, prior, like, having habits, I, I think is, is key, be it, you know, um, prioritizing my list to um, my own wellness. You know, I have a routine every morning that I need to do. Otherwise, <laughs> I crack. So, like, you know, it's. Um, I, I think those the lesson I learn on the way are, are, are pretty much trying to emulate what I've picked up. But there's nothing I can say is a, is, a, is an actual thing that, that I haven't already mentioned about how Warren's done his man management thing. I, I think I think the coaching the coaching side is. It is one that I always try to to be honest with players, be direct, but also be there with an arm range. And I think learning to who to put an arm around or who to poke 
is, is, is something I have definitely picked up along the way. And you get some wrong, you, you poke some, some players that need to cuddle and, and then some you cuddle who actually needs a good kick of the ass. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's understanding that balance and understanding people. I think that's probably the biggest thing is understanding people and, and, and learning strategies. You know, going back to the NLP stuff, you know, understanding how people learn, uh, and, uh, you know, if they're a visual learner, if they're kinesthetic, if they're, you know, audio, you know, all that sort of stuff and, and be able to put that into your delivery of your message so everyone gets it, I think was probably a big, big thing from a coaching side. In terms of hindsight as well, is there anything, and and to flip this to some extent, is there anything that you kind of look back and think you wish you could have done better? And the reason I say that is um, I was speaking to um, a Premier League football manager last week and he mentioned the relationship with owners and he took things very personal and that impacted his career at a, a football club. Is there anything that you kind of look back in a different sense of, I wish maybe I'd thought about the game differently that way, or I wish I led certain things in a certain way. Is there anything that kind of stands but, out in terms of your, your career as a whole? Um, I think, yeah, I think playing wise, I wish I'd known, I'd known then what I know now about, you know how to conduct myself, and um, because you know I, I I did get distracted. I, I liked you know going out and the, the limelight that come with the success we had. And I think I'd have done things a lot better. I think I'd have looked after my body a lot better. Um, I think that would have been a big learning. But to, to be fair, I think those learnings have shaped me better as a coach. Yeah. And you know what I'm doing now with my business, but also the coaching, it's been shaped around my learnings from my career. That's actually put me on the path of, you know, I've qualified a nutritionist, S and C, you know, I'm a coach and it's like, you know, I've got all these attributes that actually could have helped me really well. If I'd have known when I played, I think I'd have got a hundred caps in England. But you know, it's um I think it shaped me and I think the relationships with people um has definitely been a big learning and a big shape on me. You know, I've got I've definitely can read people and manage people a lot better from my learnings from playing than, than I did a few years ago. So I think that's grown with me. And I think that that's always, always an on, on, onward thing of, of growing and understanding people. And I think that's my biggest impact on my career. I think is trying to with these relationships. You know, Cause I think you get the best out of people if you build, mm. build that. So, so talk to me about your current role. You mentioned S and C and nutrition. How, um, how does that align with obviously your, your, your background? Obviously you've, you've emphasized that over the last, 40 minutes now but yeah. uh, talk to me about the the role that you have and how do you maybe inspire or um support athletes within a range um, of different disciplines i presume is that right yeah um well yeah i um, i had to for my coach career i i ended up having to develop um an interest in in s and c when in, when it did that learned that nutrition you know i got into that you know, all to give me more of a string to my bow, I think, because you know when I was uh, starting the Scottish Rugby Union, I had to do everything. I didn't have an SNC coach, so I had to pick that up. And uh, so, I, luckily, Craig White mentored me, and um, it got me passionate about it, which is brilliant. And I was already passionate about it when I was playing because I had to transform myself. Cause I had a, a middle period where I drunk a lot, got on weight, and all that stuff, and I had to change the way I was. And so, I, I got into it that way, but then I actually properly learned it post career. Um, and then, so now that gives me, you know, when I'm doing my planning for the for the program, to the sessions, to everything else, I've got insight to that, and I can support players, you know, with the nutrition and uh, support our S and C staff, have open conversations um, with our staff because I can articulate or I can understand where they're coming from. So, you know, a lot of coaches um, don't really get sort of get it, or they think they know what they want, but they, but you know understand the volumes, the intensity and the reps and all that sort of stuff that you need to put in and um, the chronic load and the, and the acute load and doing all this thing when you want to plan your your weekly training periods, like periodization and, and into the yearly plan. I can bring that with me, you know, and I can have those conversations and manage the staff around it to build that. And then, you know, player-wise, you know, the players who, who uh, have put on a bit of weight in the off-season or an injury, you know, I've been there, you know, I've been massive and had to lose a hell of a lot of weight. And uh, so I know all the tricks to do that. I, you know, and also I can help them with the understanding of nutrition and how it works. And so all that's really shaped 
my current role and and what I do for the team, um, uh, you know, outside I suppose of the of the actual physical rugby coaching. Because of the because of the nature of our conversation, I think we've kind of explored your past and yeah, where this yeah, is kind yeah, of leading yeah. you to today. So, if I was to ask you, maybe in the future, uh, around uh, your business, uh, around your um, processes in terms of supporting players, coaches, and and, and educating uh, a wide range of different people in in sport, um, what do you think your legacy will be within this area? Is there anything that you kind of set out, and how do you think you would kind of want to be remembered? Uh, in the future around um, the practices oh, yeah, that today. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I am, um, funny enough, like right now, we're trying to, um, within my role with, the, with USA Rugby and USOC, is coach education as well. So I want to leave, you know, I've been doing the US now for 10 years, so I want to leave a legacy beyond there to develop more coaches, better coaches, and hopefully I'm you know, mentoring a young coach, an ex-player, just finished playing, to take over really for me from the next Olympics. I don't think... I'll probably stay on, but I want to stay on in a, in a education capacity, maybe. So hopefully that legacy on that side. Um, and then, you know, I've started really honing a push um, mentoring coaches anyway. So I've got my own website. So I want to try and do more of that. So the future probably holds me sharing more knowledge of, of what I've built up over the 20 odd years of, of doing this. Um, and then, with the business, you know, with the Athlete Factory, we've got a few sites and we're designing and installing kit for various gyms and teams. So, you know, I, I, I want to kick that on and, you know, use that. The whole ethos, what we started is using our elite sport knowledge with everyone because the, the human body is the human body and it's only the knowledge and the programming and the equipment that makes a difference from pro sport to, to amateurs. So sharing that knowledge again with everyone who comes to our facility to get, you know, healthier, fitter, stronger, be it, you know, a mum losing weight after giving birth to a weekend warrior, to, um, you know, a pro athlete, whatever it is, uh, to, uh, you know, an academy player or whatever it is, in whatever sport is sharing that knowledge. So I hope that for the future, you know, that's going to be successful. My legacy is, is, is how many people I've had impact on, uh, be it coaching or, or lifestyle changing. Bill, where can listeners and uh, viewers find you? You mentioned uh, the Athlete Factory. I, I'll, I'm sure we can share that on social media. But oh, great, have, yeah. have you got any? Have you got anything in terms of maybe you personally that people might be able to kind of find out a little bit more? Yeah, uh, I've got my coaching website, which is philgreencoaching.com. Um, uh, yeah, and the Athlete Factory. Co. Uk. Uh, and you know, usual socials and all that, even though I'm not great at that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, th those are the two websites really there where you know they can get hold of me. Excellent, uh, Phil, thank you for your time. It's been a, an oh, interesting conversation, and uh, good luck in the future. And you, thank you. <laughs>